Object orientation comes with a lot of weird jargon, abstraction, polymorphism, inheritance, encapsulation. In fact, those are sometimes said to be the four defining principles of object orientation, as you will see if you search online or ask a chatbot. But can you really trust a chatbot? Hmm. I'm Hugh, and this is another lesson in my series on object orientation. Today, I'm going to try to summarize the four principles of object orientation, and then explain what I think is missing from that list. Let's go through these four ideas. I've already talked about encapsulation in previous lessons. If you haven't watched those, you can find them all in the playlist down below. Put simply, encapsulation means wrapping up data and code, that's variables and functions or methods, inside self-contained units called objects, and also, ideally, making those units modular, which was the subject of my last video. So, that just leaves inheritance, polymorphism, and data abstraction. In this series of lessons, I'm following the Smalltalk V tutorial, which you can download, and again, the link is down below, and we now arrive at page 14, which deals with exactly this subject. Let's start with abstraction. Now, abstraction is one of those slippery ideas that can mean different things to different people. My friendly chatbot says, Data abstraction is the process of hiding the implementation details and showing only the necessary information to the user. Well, and this is what the Smalltalk V tutorial says. A language's data abstraction capabilities determine what objects can be described. Hmm. Now, both definitions are kind of correct, but what do they really mean? Actually, I think the introduction on page one of the tutorial gives a better explanation. It says, pure object-oriented programming takes a revolutionary approach to data abstraction, providing a new dimension in which to organize the elements of a software system. For you, this means highly reusable software, truly generic code, and the opportunity to use a prototyping style of software development. Basically, this means that Smalltalk lets you create your own data types, that is, your own classes, and the Smalltalk V tutorial gives some examples. Smalltalk lets you create arbitrary new data structures, it says. Where it is generally an exception or nuisance in conventional languages, creating new data structures is done routinely when you define a new class or subclass of objects in Smalltalk. Now, when it says conventional languages, it means procedural languages like C or Pascal. In those languages, programmers typically work with a small number of fundamental data types like integers, floats and characters. To some extent, you may be able to define new types such as structures or records, but you won't be able to create new variations of, for example, an integer. Whereas in Smalltalk, you can. In fact, it's the sort of thing that Smalltalk programmers do all the time. You just write a new class, maybe based on, that is, descending from, some other class. And whereas a C programmer might expect to know exactly what an int is and all the ways in which an int can be used, a Smalltalk programmer doesn't have to know the inner workings of a class, not even the integer class, because the class has a high level of abstraction. Let's take a real-world example. In a sense, a TV set can be thought of as an abstract object. You pick up the zapper, you press some buttons, and various things happen. But you don't know how they happen. The TV defines a set of methods that respond to the messages you send to it when you press the buttons. Unless you happen to be a TV engineer or designer, you probably don't know anything about the inner workings of the TV itself, and you don't need to know that in order to use it. So the TV object is a sort of abstract data type. You don't really know what it is, you just know what it does. Abstraction is also used to describe the idea that the operation of a language is independent of the operation of the hardware. Niklaus Wirth said that the ideal is to abstract to a higher level and create programs that would then be available and runnable on all computers. The more independent of the machine is the language, the more it implements abstraction. So, in a sense, 
Obstruction is a natural consequence of message passing and modularity. The more modular your code is, the less dependent one piece of code is on any other piece of code in, in your program, which is one of the big ideas of pure object orientation. Each object looks after its own internal state, its own bounded variables and methods. Communication between one object and another is done by passing messages. Message passing and modularity implement abstraction. Polymorphism. Now, if abstraction is a fancy word for a simple idea, polymorphism is even worse. It was Mark Twain who said, don't use a $5 word when a 50 cent word will do. Allowing for inflation, I'd say polymorphism is probably a $100 word for a 50 cent idea. These days, computer science teachers and writers have extended the meaning of polymorphism to such an extent that it's often hard to figure out what the heck they're trying to describe. This is what my little AI friend has to say. Polymorphism is the ability of an object to take on many forms. Hmm. I'm not sure that helps much, to be honest. The word polymorphism comes from the Greek for many shapes. Polymorphism was already used as an idea in biology, genetics and chemistry before it got pulled into the computer programming lexicon. Just to confuse matters even more, the term polymorphic code is now also used to describe a type of self-modifying program, and that is not at all the same as polymorphism in object orientation. OK, so let's get back to basics. This is what the Smalltalk V manual says. The Smalltalk characteristic of having different objects responding uniquely to the same message is known as polymorphism. It gives the example of integer objects and string objects, which both have a method called print string. So what's so special about that? The short answer is nothing. Back in the days when object orientation was new and unusual, it needed to be explained that different objects could have methods with the same names. In C and Pascal and other procedural languages, if you had a function called print string, you couldn't have another function also called print string. But in object orientation, each object is a world unto itself. You can have a thousand objects created from 500 classes and they can all have access to a method called print string or whatever other methods you want to give them. Like I said, polymorphism is a fancy name for a simple idea. Inheritance. The next big idea is inheritance. This means that one class can be the descendant of another class and automatically inherit features from its ancestor. Here I agree with the chatbot, which tells me inheritance is a mechanism that allows one class to inherit properties and methods from another class. A class is the definition of an object. You write all your code in a class and create objects based on that class whenever you need them. For an example of inheritance, you could write a class called thing, which has a name and a description, and a class called treasure, which descends from thing and thereby automatically inherits name and description. It can then add on some other features, such as, for example, a value. The Smalltalk class browser shows you a family tree of all the classes it knows about. This is the Smalltalk V tutorial. Smalltalk organizes its classes into a hierarchy of classes and subclasses. For example, the integer class is a subclass of the number class, which is a subclass of magnitude, which is a subclass of class object, the most general Smalltalk class and parent of all other classes. And you can see that here in squeak small talk, well, here's an integer and it's a subclass of number and it's a subclass of magnitude. Each of those classes defines methods shown in the right hand window and they inherit the methods and behavior of their superclasses, the classes from which they descend. So there you are. Those are the four main features of object orientation or anyway, they are what some people and chatbots claim are the four main features of object orientation, but there's something missing. 
As I mentioned in an earlier lesson, Alan Kay, the principal designer of Smalltalk, has said that the really big idea of Smalltalk and of object orientation is message passing. And yet that's not even in the list of the four supposedly core features of object orientation. Now, I don't know who first came up with this list of four principal features, but it seems to me that it's missing something really important. The fact of the matter is that once you have message passing, most of the other features fall into place as a natural consequence. Message passing means that you can only communicate with objects by sending requests, which is like calling a function, but with the difference that it's up to the object to decide how or if it will respond to any given request. Message passing necessarily means that an object is encapsulated. Its internal details are hidden because the only way to engage with an object is to send it a message. And that means that the object or its class provides a high degree of abstraction because its implementation details are hidden. And since you can send the same messages to different objects, that also implies polymorphism. So, in short, the complicated sounding ideas of abstraction, encapsulation and polymorphism can all be summed up in the quite simple idea of message passing. OK, that's enough about theory and terminology. In the next lesson, we'll be doing some hands-on coding in Squeak Smalltalk. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, be sure to do so and click the bell icon so that you'll be informed whenever I upload new lessons. And I'll see you again quite soon.